A very good afternoon to everybody who's joining us live on YouTube in this beautiful Saturday afternoon. We want to welcome you to the fourth lecture of Ongobani, our journey to the ultimate self. Welcome everybody, wherever you're watching us from, Eastern Cape, KwaZulu Natal, even those who are watching us from abroad, we want to say a big welcome and a shout out to you all for watching us this afternoon. Let me tell you, you are in for a wonderful time this afternoon. It's our fourth lecture uh, this afternoon and our host, the label that speaks, is ready to deliver another fascinating lecture to us today. And that lecture talks about the eight poverties that can reduce self to a point of no return. And trust me, after this lecture, you will be a little, a little closer to discovering Ogutuwena Ungubani. Who are you exactly? And so before we start, I want to welcome everybody that's joining us live right now. Please feel free, take your pen and write notes and bring those questions to us. If you are on YouTube, just type them in. We will receive your questions and we will ask our host those questions in our moderation session that will take place after the lecture. Without no further delays, let me welcome this label that speaks, Umobi Ganyembe, the creator of the Black P ecosystem, a, psycho a psychologist to corporate South Africa, wisdom counselor to all mankind, a businessman, a brand strategy creator, author, and Ungubani, 360 degree coach. He teaches native kingdom ideas of wisdom and his mission is to inspire the world in general and black people in particular into talented, balanced, impactful leaders who are good stewards of talent, time, money, self, and everyday life. Before we welcome we're going to welcome him with a little poem by Usianda Kamakiwane. The poem is titled Ungubani. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to our fourth lecture. First of all, let me take this time and welcome those who are streaming live on YouTube. I know for a fact that I'm being joined by my family in Fort Lawrence, my mother, Abashana Bami, and I want to say to them I appreciate the support. I also know that we are joined by members in my hometown, Wanongoma. We welcome you to this lecture. And there are those who are joining us abroad and those who are joining us in the Eastern Cape. And then we are appreciating all of you in terms of the support that you are giving us. Let us then speak to what this business is, the fourth lecture. When you think about it, we are told we are poor as people. And we are told Africa has big issues that the world cannot help us with. And it made me wonder in terms of what is poverty? And for me, poverty is my greatest enemy. It's the one that I'm fighting with all I have. I've decided that I'm going to forge and fight a daily war on poverty. What is poverty? Poverty is a state of being inferior in quality or insufficient in amount. Poverty is the scarcity or lack of a certain amount of material possessions or money. When someone says there's absolute poverty, extreme poverty, or destitution, they are referring to complete lack of means 
that are necessary to meet basic personal needs such as food, clothing, and shelter. Think about it though, when someone says Africa is poor, is this true or this is a story that we are being told? Let me give you a profile on Africa to start with, because for me, this is my big intro. Before I challenge you on your own poverty, let us look at our continent and whether or not we are poor as Africa. Africa is the world's second largest and second most populous continent after Asia. Africa has about 30.3 million square kilometer ground, including adjacent lands. When you look at the Earth's total surface, we are 60% of the Earth's total surface, and we are 20% of it in terms of land area. There is 1.3 billion people by 2018, which accounts for 16% of the world's human population. So if Africa is poor, then can you imagine the size of this world that we occupy in our poverty? But the question is, are we really poor? Think about it, Africa's average population is the youngest among the continents. The median age by 2012 was 19.7, when the worldwide median age was 30.4. Despite a wide range of natural resources, the continent is the least wealthy per capita, possibly due in part to the legacies of European colonization in Africa. But when you look at it, despite this low concentration of wealth, the recent economic expansion shows or tells us that Africa is the future that we're looking at. I still ask you, is Africa poor as a continent? I don't believe so. I believe Africa is rich, but we are perceived to be poor. In Berlin, there was a conference in November 1884 to February 1885. For four months, the world powers or superpowers sat and dissected Africa. They gave Africa to themselves in terms of you take the Southern Africa, you will take Rhodesia, you will take whatever. They were dissecting. And they dissected Africa into 104 international borders, which separated 177 cultures and groups. This is what Lord Salisbury says in 1906, as the, the, then, British Empire, uh, the, the, the then British Prime Minister, on the occasion of signing the Anglo-French Convention of the Nigeria-Niger boundary. He says, we, the British and the French, have been engaged in drawing lines upon maps where no white man's foot ever trod. We have been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediments that we never knew exactly where the mountains and rivers and lakes were. Asuwaju says Africa has been dissected and was given to the highest bidder in terms of colonization. So my argument is that Africa we can't say Africa is poor. Think about it. We were dissected and, handed, and handed over to the highest bidder even before we could appreciate ourselves in the world. And now they take all the natural resources from the continent and take it into Europe or into everywhere in the world to even give it value. It's absurd that we are the ones who are mining gold in this continent but our gold must be sent into a distant country to give it value. We were not born like this as Africa. We were made to be like this as Africa. When the world became capitalistic in its nature, they were looking for places where they could trade people for gains. We were rich as Africa, born from kings and queens. Just the Ghanas alone when you read the history of the Ghanas, the Mansas there, even their dogs had gold collars. That's how rich we were. I know that the world right now speaks of Egypt as the superpower or as the world power or the monarch of Africa. But there were many monarchs before that. How do I know this? Because when you read the very history that Europe has produced, we know that those guys from Europe were capitalistic in nature. They wouldn't have taken Africa if Africa was not interesting at the time. 
They would have not to come to Africa if Africa was poor at the time, but they had to sell us that we are poor so that while we think about our poverty and social ills, they will squander and take our gains and take our value and divide us and divide our cultures. The sad part when you look at the borders of Africa, they're arbitrary. There are borders where there's no line that draws the borders, but the line is in the mind. Our poverty is first in the mind before it is in Africa. Africa is not poor. Africa is made to believe and think that it is poor. What about you? When you look at Ngubani and people are calling you names and giving you descriptions, are you not falling in the same tra trap as Africa? Where those who care less about you but what they can get from you then give you these devaluing phrases and descriptions and you learn to believe them. Self-actualization is the core of Ngubani. When you actualize, among other things, we should provide you with a practical approach through leadership, mentorship, and coaching so that you can help yourself to address the eight poverties I'm about to discuss today. These eight poverties are not only plaguing self, they are plaguing countries in Africa. Marcus Aurelius says, I'm made of body and soul. Now to the poor body, all things are indifferent, as it, is, as it cannot even make any distinction. To the mind, all that is not its own activity is indifferent, and its own activities are all in its control. But within these, the mind is only concerned with the present. Its activities in the future and in the past are also indifferent at any present moment. It starts with two primary poverties. Poverty of the spirit and poverty of the body. In the second lecture, I remember arguing that you are a spirit. You live in a body. You have thoughts and emotions. So today I'm saying, if anything were to engulf you, including poverty itself, it can't start in the external world. It must start within. So the biggest poverty you're going to face is the spiritual poverty, or poverty of the spirit. After all, the physical nature of poverty is not necessarily physical. Though poverty manifests itself in the visible world, its source is always the poverty of the spirit. Not the lack of resources, but the inability to see available resources and failure to find your divine position to which all your provisions are directed and failure to begin where you are. Poverty of the spirit is when spirit self has been reduced and plagued by insufficient spiritual quotient or poor spirit intelligence. According to Steve Covey, spiritual intelligence is the central and most fundamental of all the intelligences because it serves as the source of guidance for the others. David King has undertaken research on spiritual intelligence at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada. King defines spiritual intelligence as a set of adaptive mental capacities based on non-material and transcendent aspects of reality, specifically those that contribute to the awareness, integration, and adaptive application of the non-material and transcendent aspects of one's existence leading to such outcomes as deep existential reflection, enhancement of meaning, recognition of a transcendent self, and mastery of spiritual states. King further proposed four core abilities or capacities of spiritual intelligence. Number one, people who are spirit rich are always working on their critical existential thinking. They have the capacity to critically contemplate the nature of existence, reality, the universe, space, time, and other ex existential or metaphysical issues. Also, they have the capacity to contemplate non-existential issues in relation to one's existence. Number two, people who are spirit-rich understand the importance of personal meaning production. They are always improving their ability um, to, to derive personal meaning and purpose 
from all physical and mental experiences, including the capacity to create and master a life purpose. Number three, people who are spirit rich possesses transcendental awareness. They have the capacity to identify transcendent dimensions or patterns of the self. This transcendent can be personal or it can be the transcendent of others and of the physical world during normal states of consciousness accompanied by the capacity to identify their relationship to self and to the physical. The fourth thing we know that you are spirit rich is when we are forever working on your consciousness state expansion. Your understanding of power and ability to enter and exit higher states of consciousness. For instance, pure consciousness, cosmic consciousness, those who can unite, and those who can achieve oneness in achieving any feats of life are already, are already spirit wise. And there are other states of trance at one's own discretion. For instance, when you're contemplating or thinking, you're exercising your spiritual intelligence. When you're meditating, you are exercising your spiritual intelligence. When you are praying, you are exercising your spiritual intelligence. Poverty of the spirit, therefore, suggests a complete lack of critical existential thinking, a complete lack of personal meaning production, a complete lack of transcendental awareness, and a complete lack of conscious state expansion thus lacking the central and most fundamental of all the intelligences. It is the kind of poverty that renders self helpless first and then meaningless later. Because when you are helpless, you must be careful. The next thing that will happen is you'll be pointless, purposeless, because there's no use for you. While spirit selves those that are rich in spirit self that can hover above their circumstances, a poverty-stricken self feels trapped and may even be identified with personal circumstances such as, this is my life and there's nothing I can do about it. Are you spirit poor or you are spirit rich? Remember, you are the body, you are the spirit, you are the mind, you are the heart. But you are not just all of that. In totality, there is a flow. First, you are the spirit. You then live in a body. You have thoughts and emotions. You are not your body. You live in it. We're going to speak about the poverty of the body right now. You are not your body. You live in it. But it's important that you understand that what you house in this body is more powerful than the body itself. From then, being the spirit that lives in a body, you have thoughts and emotions. The human evolution has tempted us a lot. Because now that we've evolved, we think we are our thoughts. We think we are emotions. Someone says something that upsets you, you take so much in terms of what they're saying, and you take offense. And I like the word, offense is never given, it's taken. So think about it. You are a spirit, you live in a body, you possess thoughts, and emotions. So here I'm just helping you to understand that the first point of poverty must start in the spirit. So when people say we must go to church, yes, there is the part of church that was part of the history of demonizing humans, and Africa in particular. The history that has made us to feel like our ancestors are nothing but sin. The history that has made us to feel like our body is nothing but sin. For me, it's peculiar that the very thing that I'm given, that I'm close to, that I can touch and feel, that has got systems working within me, I'm made to believe it's sinful and it's something that I must of dishonor. When you go to church, you're actually going to find your spiritual intelligence. That's it. You're not going there to serve a pastor. You're not going there to, to, to join a church. Though you can in terms of temp be tempted to do so, but remember, when you go to church, you are going to ignite or awaken or enlighten your spirit so that you go back to the core of who you are. Because in actual fact, anything that must destroy you first must destroy your spirit. 
Let me say that again. Anything that must have an attempt at destroying you completely first must destroy your spirit. But anything that destroys every other thing but the spirit can never destroy you in full. In full. The next poverty is poverty of the body. This is when body self has been reduced and plagued by insufficient physical quotient or poor body intelligence. This poverty is experienced when self lacks understanding of how the body works, which if you do, leads to a greater sense of well-being and an enriched sense of self. It is true that self relies on human biology, the human functionality provided by the influences and interplay of many diverse fields such as genetics, evolution, physiology, anatomy, epidemiology, anthropology, ecology, nutrition, population, genetics, and social cultural influences. Body intelligence includes aspects of self which are sophisticated in their physiology. Think about it. You don't have to think when you chew. Something happens naturally. And as you throw food inside your mouth and you chew, when you throw it down your throat in the esophagus, there's something called epi epiglottis, a small door that controls air and food. When you choke, it's when the wrong thing goes to the wrong part. Those things happen without you knowing. It's your body intelligence. When you're hungry and you eat your food and you taste it with your mouth, sections of your mouth and your tongue can taste something sweet or bitter. That's part of your body intelligence. In fact, when you're feeling cold in your body and you feel the shivers in your body, it's your body intelligence that's responding because you are too wise than you think in your body. In fact, when you cut your arm, the body is its own doctor. It can blood clot, it can send B cells quickly so that it protects you from anything that can invade that entrance. So for me, if you fail then at spiritual intelligence, don't fail at body intelligence. Because maybe spiritual intelligence, you are arguing that it was sent to us by those who are colonizing us, and therefore it's Christianity or it's traditional beliefs. Maybe let's not care so much about that, but what about your body then? What about the fact that you've got this genetic makeup, that you have the power to procreate and all those things? For me, that says I've got a body that I must look at. There are certain elements that you must look at for body-rich people to be body-rich. First of all, appreciate your body genes, your genetic variation and heredity, which carries wisdom of the molecular structure and function of genes and gene behavior in context of all cell organisms patterns of inheritance from parent to offspring, and gene distribution, variation, and change in population. You must understand that you are not a mistake, that even your genetic makeup carries some intelligence that, if well understood, can advance the cause of self. Number two, if you want to be body rich, you must appreciate body evolution, which carries wisdom of repeated formation of new species or speciation, change within species or anagenesis, genesis, and loss of species, which is extinction. Throughout the evolution of history, when you look at the life on Earth, as demonstrated by shared sets of morphological and biochemical traits, including shared DNA sequences, you can tell there is more to the living organism than meets the eye. You must understand that if you sleep on yourself, you'd render yourself extinct or run a risk of being extinct. Dinosaurs right now, our children can never see them. Why? At some point, they existed, they became extinct. Now they're history. You too, if you don't do anything about yourself and your identity, you would once exist, be history and be forgotten. The third thing that people who are body rich do, they appreciate physiology which carries wisdom of the fundamental biophysical and biochemical phenomena, the coordinated homeostatic, homeostatic control mechanisms, which is now used by the when people are ill, you now go to a homeostat and they help you to process certain things, and the continuous communication between cells, which is a powerful thing that you have. You must understand that even your cells carry so much power, which carries on the fight of survival. Number four, people who are body rich, they appreciate body anatomy, 
which carries wisdom of the structure and function of human organisms and their parts, including systems, organs, and tissues. Also, the appearance and position of the various body parts, the materials from which they are composed, their locations in the body, and their relationship with other body parts. You must understand that even your internal systems work day and night, and they carry clues about natural endowments of self and its abilities from within. Number five, people who are body rich, they appreciate body epidemiology, which carries wisdom of the distribution in terms of who, when, and where, and the determinants of health and diseases conditions in defined populations. It is a cornerstone of public health and shapes policy decisions and evidence-based practice in identifying risk factors in terms of disease and targets for preventive health care. It includes disease causation, transmission, outbreak investigation, disease surveillance, forensic epidemiology, occupational epidemiology, screening, biomonitoring, and comparisons of treatment effects such as in clinical trials. You must understand that the condition of your body in itself is a state, that it's a state of health, that if you constantly understand and you constantly work on, we declare you as healthy. So we must negotiate this understanding of self. Think about it. The self can even fight in the presence of disease and pandemics. Look at how coronavirus has challenged our way of life. But also think about those bodies in terms of who were able to withstand and recover from COVID-19 while others had perished. The sixth thing about being body wise or body rich is that you must appreciate body anthropology, which carries wisdom of humans and human behavior and societies in the past and present. It has different categories such as social anthropology and cultural anthropology, which study the norms and values of society, linguistic anthropology, which studies how language affects social life, and biological or physical anthropology, which studies the biological development of humans. You must understand that self is part of a larger body of society and is an integral part of mankind with language as either an aid or barrier. The seventh thing you must note in the body with intelligence is that you must appreciate your body ecology, which carries wisdom of interactions among organisms and their environment. It includes ecosystems which are dynamically interacting systems of humans, the communities they make up, and the living and non-living components of their environment. You must understand that the environment is powerful and you need to moderate yourself in order to be fluid as you participate in that ecosystem. But also, once you understand your body intelligence, you'll stop going around looking for ecosystems. You'll create your own if one is missing. If someone is angry, they are living in the ecosystem of chaos. What you could do is switch and switch your peace by then you're inviting the ecosystem of peace. If someone is violent, they are living in the ecosystem of violence. To them, blood, pain, and terror is what makes sense. You can somehow just change the environment and create an ecosystem that favors you. If you are born from a not so fortunate family, you can change that by changing the ecosystem. Because if your parents, immediate parents, are not that successful, what stops you then from approaching the extended family of mankind? That you'll do by respecting and being helpful, but also you could do by going and knocking at the door and saying, please help me. That is you then understanding that we are more than just individuals. We are integral in the part of life. The eighth thing that body rich people do is they appreciate body nutrition, a very important subject, which carries wisdom, interpre interpretation of nutrients and other substances in food in relation to maintenance, growth, reproduction, health, and disease. It includes food intake, absorption, assimilation, biosynthesis, catabolism, and excretion. The diet of, a, of an organism is what it eats, which is largely determined by the availability and palatability of foods. For humans, a healthy diet includes preparation of food and storage methods that preserve nut nutri nutrients from oxidation, heating, or leaching. 
and that reduces risk of foodborne illnesses. You must understand that every food decision that you make has a long-term consequence. And if you are deliberate about keeping the negative consequences minimal in what you consume in your body, in terms of nutrition, you're already body intelligent. Strangely, we have evolved as humans over the centuries, but we've become more stupid. We don't know what to eat anymore. A dog has remained unevolved if you put something that a dog doesn't eat, it walks away. We know, we don't walk away, we find some way to nibble, to lick it, to do whatever. Tell people, this is not good for you, junk is not good for you, but hey, they've made junk to be nice. So you're fighting with all these other things. I don't mean for you to be critical and judge people yourself when you eat those things, but just know that the minute you deposit something that doesn't work with your system, You've invited a negative ecology into your system or negative nutrition into your system. When Eckhart Tolle was asked, why have most religions condemned or denied the body? It seems that spiritual seekers have always regarded the body as a hindrance or even as sinfully responded. Why have so few seekers become finders? On the level of the body, humans are very close to animals. All the basic bodily functions, pleasure, Pain, breathing, eating, drinking, defecating, sleeping, the drive to find a mate and procreate, and of course, birth and death. We share these with the animals. A long time after their fall from a state of grace and oneness into illusion, humans suddenly woke up in what seemed to be an animalistic body, and they find this very disturbing. Don't fool yourself. You are no more than an animal. This seemed to be the truth that was staring them in the face. But it was too disturbing a truth to tolerate. Adam and Eve saw that they were naked and they became afraid. Hmm. Became afraid, self-disguised. Unconscious denial of their animalistic nature set in very quickly. The threat that they might be taken over by powerful instinct instinctual drives and revert back to complete unconsciousness was indeed a very real one. Shame and taboos appeared around certain parts of our body parts and bodily functions, especially sexuality. The light of our consciousness was not yet fully strong or fully developed for us to make friends with the, anim an with the animalistic nature of ourselves, to allow it to be and enjoy that aspect of ourselves. So think about it. Today we are refrained or we are stopped from going deep into the body because you are scared that the body is sinful. For me, this is weird. You meet a person who is busy ingesting something that's bad for their system and they carry on and do that and say, I'm helpless, I cannot help myself here. And you're like, that's how, how devalued your body has become. I'm not speaking about the body parts in terms of how genders are fighting the power of control over who has authority over who, where men are sexualizing women or women are playing a game of being sexualized and advancing in that space. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking the mere embrace of your own body in terms of what you carry on the inside. When you look at it, it's an illusion that we don't have a body or a body is sin. The body is the most powerful thing that you have. When religions arose, this disassociation of the body became more pronounced as you are not your body belief. Countless people in the East and in the West throughout the ages have tried to encounter our supreme self, salvation or enlightenment through denial of the body. This took the form of denial of sense pleasures and of sexuality in particular, fasting and other ascetic practices. They even, inflicted, they even inflict body on the, uh, pain on the body in an, an attempt to weaken or punish the body because it's regarded as sinful. In Christianity, this used to be called mortification of the flesh. Others have tried to escape the body by entering trans, stances, uh, trans, trans states or seeking out of the body experience. Many still do. Even Buddha is said to have done this practicing of body denial for six years through fasting and extreme forms of asceticism. For six years, six years he was trying 
to get out of himself to meet a higher power. He did not attain enlightenment for the six years as long as he was denying the body. The fact is that no one has ever become enlightened through denying or fighting the body or through an out-of-the-body experience. Although such an experience can be fascinating and can give you a glimpse of the state of liberation from the material form, in the end, you'll always have to return to the body where the essential work of transformation takes place. Transformation is through the body, not away from it. This is why all the true masters would never advocate the fighting or living of the body, even though their mind-based followers have tried to do so. The body self is therefore very critical for the manifestation of the divine order, as it serves as a platform that is physical. Our ancestors from ancient of old and the angels in recent times are jealous of us as the living because obviously we possess the body which carries the purpose of creation and transformation which the dead cannot facilitate. The poverty of the body is therefore a greatest hindrance to our redemptive self-statement self when he said, your whole body will be filled with light. Once then the primary poverties have engulfed you, which is the poverty of the spirit and the poverty of the body, then there are two secondary poverties that await you. Poverty of the mind and poverty of the heart. Poverty of the mind is when mind self has been reduced and plagued by insufficient intellectual caution or poor mind intelligence. According to Raymond Cattell, there are two types of cognitive abilities in a revision of psychologist Charles Spearman's concept of general intelligence. Number one, people who are mind-rich possess what he calls fluid intelligence, which is hypothesized as the ability to solve novel problems by using reasoning, which includes the broad ability for mind self to form concepts and solve problems using unfamiliar information or novel procedures. Number two, people who are mind-rich, he found that they possess something he calls crystallized intelligence, or GC, which is hypothesized as a knowledge-based ability that is very dependent on education and experience, which includes the breadth and depth of your acquired knowledge, the ability to communicate one's knowledge, and the ability to reason using previously learned experiences or procedures. In addition to this fluid intelligence and this crystallized intelligence, he found that there are other theories that you'd find. His student, John L. Horn, who later argued fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence were not the only one among several factors, he found these other ones that we have in our own minds in terms of our mind intelligence. People who are mind rich, they possess what he calls quantitative reasoning or GQ. The ability of mind self to comprehend quantitative, quantitative concepts and relationships and to manipulate numerical symbols. Number two, people who are mind rich, he found that they possess reading and writing ability, or GRW, which includes basic reading and writing skills. People who are mind rich possess short term memory, or GSM, the ability of self to apprehend and hold information in immediate awareness and then use it within a few seconds. People who are mind-rich possess long-term storage and retrieval, which, we call, which he calls GLR. The ability of mind self to store information and fluently retrieve it later in the process of thinking. People who are mind-rich possess visual processing, or GV. The ability of mind self to perceive, analyze, synthesize, and think with visual patterns, including the ability to store and recall visual representations. People who are mind-rich possess auditory processing, or GA, the ability of mind self to analyze, synthesize, and discriminate auditory stimuli, including the ability to process and discriminate speech sounds that may be presented under distorted conditions. People who are mind-rich possess processing speed, or GS, the ability of mind self to perform automatic cognitive tasks, particularly when measured to maintain focused attention. People who are mind-rich possess decision, reaction, um, reaction time, or speed, which is GT, which reflects the immediacy with which mind self can react to stimuli or a task typically measured 
in seconds or fractions of seconds, which must not be confused with processing speed, which typically is measured in intervals of two to three minutes. When you do get lost in what I'm telling you about your mind, maybe it's because you haven't studied your mind as much as you should. When you watch the movie Mo Lucy, we are told that even dolphins use more of their mental capacity than humans. Apparently, we, lose them, we use less than 10% of our mental capacity. How do I know this is true? When you look at matriculants and the uni university entrance, we are taught that you need streams or subject streams. And around grade 8, 9, 10, they help you then to choose which career streams to follow. And the mistake that teachers make, they don't make you choose cater streams based on what your life would require in knowledge. They make you choose cater streams based on what you are able or capable to do or phantom, which is the biggest mistake. We come out of metric already narrowed into a field of study. You are either in commerce, in science, general studies, that's it. And I believe that's the biggest mistake because then that limits your mind and narrows your mind. Even if you don't know mathematics, you're going to have to count money. <laughs> have you thought about that? Even if you go to commerce, you're going to have to know sociology and psychology. Because it's about your own mind and the people in your surrounding. So unfortunately, when you look at the outputs of university, 70% is humanities, which is great. Because it says in Africa, we are more human-oriented in our subjects. But actually, no. Capitalism says, don't focus on that. That doesn't make more money. Focus on the 10 to 15% economies and the 5 to 10% sciences, which for me then messes up who we are as humans. By the way, right now robotics are coming in the fourth industrial revolution to replace you and I. Soon we're going to realize we were never made to be work machines. We were made to be relating beings. Even our minds is able to sense more than we know. So we've discussed now the spiritual intelligence, body intelligence, the mind intelligence. Can we then look at the heart intelligence in terms of what happens when heart is poor? Poverty of the heart is when heart self has been reduced and plagued by insufficient emotional quotient or poor heart intelligence. Emotional intelligence is defined as the capacity to be aware of, control, and express one's emotions and to handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathetically. It is the capacity of self to recognize their own emotions and those of others, discern between different feelings and label them appropriately, use emotional information to guide thinking and behavior, and manage and or adjust emotions to adapt to environments or achieve one's goals. Made popular by Daniel Goleman and defined as the array of skills and characteristics that drive leadership performance, this is what the heart intelligence is. Studies have shown that people with high emotional intelligence have greater mental health, job performance, and leadership skills. Emotional competencies are not innate talents, so you're not born with them, but rather learn cap capabilities that must be worked on and can be developed to achieve outstanding performance. Goldman posits that individuals are born with a general emotional intelligence that determines their potential for learning emotional competencies. According to Daniel Goleman, there are five key elements of emotional intelligence if you want to acquire. One, people who are hard rich, they possess something you call self-awareness. The ability to know one's emotions, strengths, weaknesses, drives, values and goals, and recognize their impact on others while using gut feeling to guide decisions. Number two, People who are hard rich, he says, they possess something he calls self-regulation, which involves controlling or redirecting one's disruptive emotions and impulses and adapting to ch changing circumstances. Three, people who are hard rich possess what he calls social skills. They constantly work on their mastery of how to manage relationships to move or influence people in the desired direction. Number four, people who are hard rich, he says, they possess empathy. They consider that people's feelings, especially when making decisions beyond their own personal advantage. Number five, people who are hard rich possess motivation. B 
being driven to achieve for the sake of achievement. They carry an intrinsic energy that drives them even when life gets tough so that they remain focused and, and committed until the end. The emotional intelligence of those who are average can be categorized into three main models. The ability model, the mixed model, and the trait model. The ability model is concerned with the ability to perceive emotions, integrate emotions to facilitate thoughts, understand emotions, and regulate emotions to promote personal growth. Mixed model is about fixed effects and random effects, including a wide array of competences and skills that drive leadership performance. And the trait model is about emotional self-perception and how an individual perceives their own emotional abilities. These emotional abilities and their perception of them then affect their behaviors and perceived cognitive and behavioral abilities. The poverty of the heart leads to social relationships for children being negative. And as adults, we grow old to experience the same negativity. So our problems start when we are young, but actually we carry them through because then that dents our emotional intelligence. When people were telling you you're a loser or a failure, and people were deserting you or leaving you or not loving you or not showing you appreciation, they were hurting your feelings and instead they were hurting your emotional intelligence. And before you know it, you start singing the same tune or chorus that other people are singing, which is negative about you. And these primary and secondary properties begin to create a ripple effect where in the end they result to a hindered or delayed self-actualization. Others die without actualizing self while gripped by resentment, anger, and unforgiveness because somebody did or did not do what they expected. Once the primary and secondary poverty have engulfed you, poverty of the spirit, poverty of the body, poverty of the mind, and poverty of the heart, once you're in the grasp of those, then tertiary poverty will do as they wish with you, which is poor family, poor finance, poor career, and poor calling. These are complex and can seem impossible to address once the spirit, body, mind, and heart have been completely reduced. Here, poverty creates polarization between personality and centrality, centrality being the personal traits of a group. And this will always pose a greater challenge and divide when it comes to human mastery of spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional states and their sustainability. Poor family is a misalignment caused by poor spirit intelligence and poor body intelligence combined. This is a broken family crisis where members of the family do not trust each other and the husband or wife feeling that their marriage was a mistake, children feeling like it's their fault that mommy and daddy aren't happy, families just not getting along. Let's not say much about broken families crisis because I mean we have many of those. The truth of the fact of the truth of the matter is that some people can heal from these family brokenness, but some carry the burden for the rest of their lives. The next one is poor finance. Poor finance is a misalignment caused by poor body intelligence and poor mind intelligence combined. This is a common form of poverty, the economic kind, which starts from the kind of father or dad you had, whether rich dad or poor dad, and whether or not you inherited any wealth. Since this kind of poverty is, it combines poor body intelligence and poor mind intelligence, the, the assumption is that like me, you didn't inherit anything from, in fact, you didn't even know your father to start with. Or maybe your father was there, but he himself was plagued by severe poverty of finance. Meaning that you have to start from zero. Without inheritance, your poor finance begins to write your money story. Usually the urgent issue is the issue of income. Without a proper kind of income, one is left without much option because of the high school dropout and unemployment rate so that you chase ends meet. Thus, jumping straight into a vicious circle where poverty breeds poverty. And because you are not given any wealth by those who came before you, you think then you must go and chase income so that it's survival. And with the income as well, it's sad then because as you get paid the income, the expenses for you to go to work sometimes become more than the income you're getting itself. Which is very strange then, because how then do I manage this income issue? 
How do I even get there? When you look at the households and the individuals in general, we look at income as wages, salaries, profits, inter interest payments, rents, and other forms of earnings received in a given period of time. But for a black man, that is not feasible. In fact, that is not available to them. We've only known income to be one, salary. But even when we are paid then, we then have to go through what we call peacocks mentality. What do peacocks do? They show off in terms of their money. So we start using our money to flaunt to people who don't even care about us. Or we go back then and go back home and start depending on the parent to help us. But when you think about it, whether we are peacocks or not, the question is, do we then understand that we are financial poor or finance poor? When I say finance poor, it's not an indictment on you in terms of a shame upon you, but it's a truth that you have to face because if you don't inherit an inheritance, then you are not wealthy, but you are rich. And the danger of being rich is materialistic. Wealth is different though. How then do I even bridge this gap of finance poor poverty? or getting us income, they say it's education. But with education, it's half the story because with education, you are educated to be employed. And some of you have left your qualifications or you've left out university without with qualifications and you're not employed because there's unemployment. So they taught you qualification, but they never taught you innovation and entrepreneurship. So your finance poverty continues. And some of you were given money in terms of loans or nest facilities that were giving you money and now you have a debt even before you start working. Because you're trying to address your financial poverty, but it ended up engulfing you even more. Throughout history, people say, for the love of, for the love of money, um, money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, but think about it, actually. The same way people didn't teach us well about our body, we are not being taught well about money itself. Yesterday, I went to my barber with my daughter to get my hair cut. We waited for something like an hour. And we asked those who work with him in the salon that he owns, we're like, where is he? They're like, he didn't sleep. He won lotto. I opened my eyes, I said, he won lottery? How much? They say 3,000. I said, oh my goodness. So for 3,000, you didn't sleep at home and now you are missing up on income. It's all the issues of our poverty and how they engulfed us. Once you have poor family and you have poor career, sorry, poor, poor, poor finance, the next thing you'd experience is poor career, which is a misalignment caused by poor mind intelligence and poor heart intelligence combined. Let me begin by saying that I'm aware of the huge debate that's going on right now between a career and a job, which are the components of the same poverty of career. The difference between a career and a job is that a job is something you do simply to earn money, but a career is a series of connected employment opportunities. A job has minimal impact on your future work life, but career provides experience and learning to fuel you into your future. So if I were you, I'll focus more not on a job, but on a career. So that even if I don't like the job I'm doing, but if it's leading me towards my career, I'll stay with it so that it adds my experience and exposure. Because in the end, your career poverty limits your income, limits your ability to look after your family, and limits your ability to tender to the needs of self. Let us agree that career has nothing to do with the job status so that even a gardener can build a strong career through the development of that career, which is a lifelong process of managing your learning, your work, your leisure, your transitions in order to move toward a personally determined and evolving or preferred future. So what I'm saying then to you is when you're employed, look at something called organizational development. Look at how you are managing your career within that workplace and how in the management of that, the organization is helping you to progress into the future. The last poverty in the four tertiary poverties, which is family poor, um, finance poor, career poor, the last one is poor calling. When you look at the poor calling, it's a misalignment caused by poor heart intelligence and poor, and poor um, spirit intelligence combined. It's defined as a strong inner impulse toward a particular cause of action, especially when accompanied by conviction of divine influence or the vocation or profession in which one 
customarily emerges, according to Merriam Webster's dictionary. Calling can be categorized into three. Number one, there is effectual calling, where the Calvinist um, a Christian soteriology um, at, at some point call it auto salutis, in which supreme self calls you into the service of that higher self, where we are serving in the churches. When you look at Wayne Grudem, what it suggests is that it's a summoning of a king of the universe that has such power that it, can brings, you, it brings you to respond to a call of a king. When you look at the holy book, it speaks in the book of Acts about the supreme self opening um, Paul, um, Lydia's heart to hear Paul's message, which is then effectual calling, where you hear the message from an external somebody. The next one is the religious calling, which is sort of a religious vocation, which comes from the Latin word call, that may be professional or voluntary and idiosyncratic to different religions, may come from another person, from a divine messenger, or from within oneself. When you look at the idea of a vocation or calling, it is played in terms of a, it's played a significant role in terms of Christianity. When you look at all these other ones in terms of hermits, monks, nuns, they are rigorous in their following of a regime or a religious regime in terms of this is how they live. That is a religious calling. When you look at someone who's called as a man of a cloth or a clergyman, they are part of that calling. But there's another calling that I've discovered that Gurudam speaks about. It's vocational occupation which is the Latin word meaning a call or summons. Did you know that if you serve in your career very well, like very well, when I say very well, it means you are paid fulfillment as part of what you do. That is spiritual. That is actually vocational. That is a calling. When you look at my life, I have a gift of the gap that allows me to inspire people which I've used effectually with my personal relationship with our supreme self, religious in prophecy, occupationally as a public speaker, and professionally as a business strategist, and the reward is fulfillment, which is priceless. Without these, myself will have been rendered calling poor. Marcus Aurelius says, dig inside yourself. Inside there is a spring of goodness ready to gush out at any moment if you keep digging. Let me speak now in the closing on the two elements what you feed self, and what makes self to suffer. Spirit feeds on peace. Body feeds on nutrition. Mind feeds on knowledge. Heart feeds on love. If you starve the spirit, self is bound to self suffer from chaos and violence, which can lead to a total absence of peace. If you starve the body, self is bound to suffer from malnutrition and disease, which can lead to the total decay and dissolution. If you starve the mind, self is bound to suffer from ignorance and stupidity, which can lead to the total debase of reason and the engulfing by hopelessness. If you starve the heart, self is bound to suffer from hatred and mistrust, which can lead to the total absence of compassion and benevolence. Self must be fed daily in order to achieve total bliss and escape, and escape perpetual and absolute despair. In 46 BC, Julius Caesar took a group of his legion soldiers through a river called Rubicon, 21 kilometer long. And they sailed through that to go and fight or in defiant of a Roman emperor. When they got on the other side after 21 kilometers of body of water, when they stepped out of those ship, he said, burn the ship. They all look at him and say, but how are you going to go back? He said, if I leave the ship for you, you will think you have an option to go back. We are here to fight. You're either fighting or you're going to die fighting. No one is going to have to run back to the ships to then sail back to the city. And he's said to have said, Aliyah Iakta Est, a saying which means a die is cast. He was throwing a die for them. Think about it, though. When these poverties have engulfed you, you reach what we call Rubicon, a point of no return, where all the resources to retreat are bent and now you must forge forward. So I'm saying to you, even when you face an uncomfortable situation or position in your life, it's an opportunity to bend the ship and fight where you find yourself. Self requires continuous rest. When the spirit is tired, self is fatigued. When the body is tired, self is exhausted. When the mind is tired, self is depressed. When the heart is tired, self is hopeless. Without rest, self is bound to shut down the dial on any cardinal. When all cardinals are tired, self crosses the Rubicon 
a point of no return, and life loses meaning and worth, and one gets so reduced that they can take their very own lives, literally. American, America's sweetheart and world-famous actress Marilyn Monroe seemed to have a perfect life on the surface. Her films were very much popular, and that grossed more than, more, than, more than $200 million by the time she died in the year 1962. At only 36 years old of age, she was found dead by apparent overdose of barbiturates. Monroe took her own life. Alexander McQueen, well-known British fashion designer, took a cocktail of drugs, including cocaine, sleeping pills, and tranquilizers before hanging himself with one of his favorite belts. Only nine days after his mother, mother had died, McQueen took his own life. There have not been that many famous comedians in times past as beloved as Robin Williams was. He was perhaps the most well-known person for his remarkable accurate, accurate impressions and even roles in films like Mrs. Doubtfire and Dead Poets Society. Sadly, he hung himself in the year 2014 after years of suffering from dementia as well as depression and also recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Williams, Williams took his own life. Remember the quiet, adorable Baron twins from Everybody Loves Raymond? Sadly, one of the brothers named Sawyer Sweeten shot himself right in the head in the year 2015 when he was just 19 years old. It has been reported that the main motivations were likely lingering money problems, bullying due to gay rumors, and also career struggle. Sweeten took his own life. Who wasn't shocked by the untimely passing here at home of Professor Bongani Mayosi by suicide on 27 July 2018. Having reportedly struggled with depression for two years, Prof Mayosi took his own life and left a remarkable career. What is your take on suicide? Is it necessary? Or it's the body, mind, soul, heart saying I'm tired? Would you regard yourself as suicidal? Would you regard your life as positive or negative? Because that alone tells us where your life will end. How do you retreat when self is under spiritual, emotional, intellectual, and physical pressure? The ultimate flow is when all the cardinals of self are fully immersed and imbued with love. In other words, I'm saying to you, how do I know you are not poor in these eight areas? Love your spirit, love your body, love your mind, love your heart, love your family, love your finance, love your career, and love your, your calling. To allow love to inspire your social, nature, financial, intellectual, productive relationship, and human capital, according to the divine order, this for me is a lifelong journey that draws self ever closer to actualization through Ungubani 360 degrees. If you've watched the movie Fireproof, there's this line, for me, when a being is trying to actualize himself, he says this, like a man that is trying to win the heart of a woman, he studies her. He learns her likes, dislikes, habits, and hobbies. But after he wins her into marriage, he often stops learning about her. If the amount he studied her before marriage was equal to a high school degree, he should continue to learn about her until he gains a college degree, a master's degree, and ultimately a doctorate degree. It is a lifelong journey that draws his heart ever closer to her. So you too, study self. Learn likes, dislikes, and habits, and hobbies of self. And even after you win into mastery of self, don't stop learning about self. If the amount you studied self before mastery was equal to a high school degree, you should continue to learn about self until you gain a college degree, a master's degree, and ultimately a doctorate degree. It is a lifelong journey that draws your heart ever closer to self. From me to you, stop being poor. Because your poverty is not in your surrounding. Your poverty is in these eight areas that we've just discussed. Fight and fight and fight and fight. But maybe don't fight. Just love. Love your spirit. Love your body. Love your mind. Love your heart. Love your family, love your career, love your finance, and love your, your calling. And who knows, if love as the embodiment of all things living has such power, 
Maybe you too can conquer whatever you are facing. Thank you for enjoying the lecture.